So, um, hey everybody, I don't know what happened. I am embedding a new um, stream here in our event. Give me a second. Let's see. Okay. I don't think we ever got the part two hangout on the same day. <laughs> we have sequels now. That's awesome. <laughs> cool. Yeah, you know, just one kind of call. I did the same thing. Okay. So, half the time, I basically. Uh, Okay, so we should be live with the new feed. Yes, we're back. Okay, great, wonderful. So I hope the, the first part got recorded. Um, we will figure that out afterwards. Uh, so um, Kevin and America, uh, can I have you chat in the meantime here while I send an email to um, Emily and, um, and Evan and see if they uh, can come back? Sure, I don't see much of Kevin. I just see his image. Oh, there's okay. Evan. Great. Evan is back. Great. Okay, wonderful. So um, let's let's go back to. Uh, I'm gonna start asking the next question. Okay, and we'll wait for Emily to join us. Um, so we we were transitioning from the topic of tools um, used to sort of what I wanted to segue to is. Um, oh, great. Hi, Emily. Hi. <laughs> so I wanted to um, segue to the next part of our conversation, which is really about um, how do you handle uh, different clients on more of a knowledge level. So some people, I'm sure, know a lot about architecture. Some people don't know a whole lot. Um, a lot of people probably have no idea how you work behind the scenes unless they've commissioned um, architectural work before. So can you talk a little bit about how you handle the different types of knowledge? So um, I would say for us, um, I think it's really important to get to know your client. Um, and some clients are really good at reading floor plans. Others aren't. Um, so I think just like there are different learning styles, um, some clients respond a lot better to physical models or digital models, um, drawings, renderings. I think you have to um, try out a lot of different presentation tools and styles to figure out what most resonates with them to communicate your ideas. Um, I think it's also important to kind of think, what are they most interested in hearing about, um, which sometimes is not always what we're most interested in talking about. Um, so it's good to keep all those things in mind. Ah, yeah, that's interesting. I've had, I've had a client before where it took a couple months and I finally realized that she couldn't read a floor plan at all. Mm -hmm. And and we had kept sending floor plans and, and then I, I sat down in the room with her and and she just turned the plan around and said, wait, is this the is this the that and is that no and they were completely backwards and um, and so then it was like oh man I can't I have to stop doing this you know I have to figure out a new way to present this to her and so then it became always pictures whenever we talked about something it was photos mm -hmm. or renderings I, I do find that um, the hand, you know hands-on is always great but sometimes even hands-on for me is just sitting down with you know whatever I've brought whether it's a um, a plan or a um, SketchUp model or rendering or something and you know pen and paper and, and you know trace as you said before but just pen in, in hand and, and, and talking and sketching and really getting into it with the client seems to always at least bring them all the way in and yeah. you can definitely see when they're on the same page or when they're not getting it. Yeah. I would add too that um, you know often you know, we're looking at the buildings that we're designing every day, so it's sort of second nature to us. Um, and so when we're presenting, we'll all often throw out a bunch of ideas because we're really excited about them. And um, I think also giving the client time to let it sink in a little bit and absorb what they're talking, what we're talking about, is really important because um, often we're throwing a lot at them all at once. Yeah, you know, uh, something that I wanted to bring up was. Um, that, that leads into this, but it's kind of the opposite, where a lot of times client want to see stuff before the meeting. Yeah. And, man, that's like, that, that has almost never worked. Because <laughs> what happens is, is they come in and they're like, they, they're like, well, why'd you do this and why'd you do this and I hate this. And, and, and it's only because you didn't get to present it to them. Yeah. And so, again, it, it's like at least, at the very least, you have to have a conversation over the phone with them while they're looking at it. You can't just email it 
and expect them to get it and to see what you did. And so I've had that backfire way more than I'd like to admit. Um, but you've got to walk them through it somehow. It's obviously the best to do that in person. Um, and so a lot of times when you are dealing with a large group, um, you know, they want to see it before because they don't want you to present something that they know everybody's going to hate, right? Um, and so you've got to talk them through it first before you show up and just smack it out of the blue with to them. And, and they, they, they don't know what to expect, so they they don't because they don't want to hate it in front of everybody, <laughs> but it it is their it's their right to hate it. I mean, they could not like what you did at all, but you've got to get that through to them uh, somehow. And it's never just email something because the phone call or the email back will always be, for the most part, like, what are you thinking? You know? Yeah, I agree. So it sounds like um, we need to talk about uh, some some human interaction here and some ways to talk to people and communicate. And I wonder if you have some tips for that. So the you know the first one I heard is like definitely human in person um, communication or on the phone if in person is is not possible. Uh, what else have you have you learned um, presenting over the years? I think too, um, you know, often we'll start off a meeting um, sort of saying this is what we heard you say before and this is how we've responded to it. So starting each meeting with, you know, this is where we ended up at the last presentation. This is what we heard you say um, and this is how we've responded to it. I think it's really important to sort of touch back to that. Um, and then I think also having an idea for each meeting what decisions you want to have made by the end of the meeting and making that really clear or what are the important topics for each meeting and what you hope to get out of it. Do you do you say these topics or do you, you know, are you clear at the beginning like we are gonna discuss XYZ at this meeting with you? Yes and you know we're hoping that by the end of this meeting we'll have a floor plan that we've all decided on. Mm -hmm. um, but to get that out right at the beginning of the meeting so that expectations are set or the tone of the meeting is set in a way. Great. What about you, Evan? What tips do you have for us? Um, well, I, I think those are some good, like meeting ninja tips. Definitely, <laughs> got it. You, it, it's you're there for. It's a very expensive endeavor to have a meeting. You know, if you've got six or eight or ten people in a room for a couple hours, that's expensive. So, yeah. something else that I'll do just to kind of keep it on topic is I have like a no grazing policy where where you you gotta put your phone in a basket. <laughs> at, the, at the door, so that because if those people aren't engaged, they shouldn't be there anyway. So I think uh, you only invite people to the meeting that that definitely need to be there, who are decision makers, so that you can move the project forward instead of having a middle person there who goes back and takes it to their boss and then they present it to the boss. That's another recipe for disaster. So you've got to watch out for that as well. America, what are some of your um, tips? Uh, well, to start with, uh, kind of going back to maybe even before where Emily was, uh, is listening to the client and, you know, get all of the information, <clears throat> excuse me, you possibly can from them, you know, like we've all been saying, obviously it's it's really about the client, it's not about what you bring, but, um, so, listening and making sure you're hearing everything they say rather than already thinking of an idea, um, and I know, Aurora, you and I talked about this, um, and I'll share... Um, basically my go-to is Mark LePage, an entrepreneur architect, and he's got, um, let me find this. And we've had uh, Mark before on a couple of our hangouts, so he's definitely a very resourceful, um, he has a very resourceful site online. Here it is. There you go. Let's so, um, mm -hmm. this is in his, uh, in the academy, and then um, I think it's in um, the resource guide. So he's got uh, a number of these, and this is the sales system, and then there's one also that is um, how to, I guess, the eight steps to keep a client happy. Um, and these things, I mean, I just go through it and read it, and it's it's how to work with your client. And this one, um, he talks about listening throughout, just just in in multiple in, in a lot of his posts, but listening first and really uh, knowing your client. So that's great. Okay, so I'm going to invite you to, to post a link on our event page after okay. the hangout. 
Um, so I think we have some comments and questions from our audience. Kevin, do you want to jump in and, uh, and take over with these questions? Yeah, um, I do have one individual uh, by the name of Gil. He has two questions. Um, so he wants to know, um, I guess that you have to know, really know um, the tools that you're using. What do you think about that? And then the second one would be, um, do you record the meetings or just take notes? I think you, you've you got to practice. If you're going to be using anything fancy, mm -hmm. um, if you don't practice and it just goes off completely the wrong way, it can set your meeting into a tailspin. So yeah, definitely have backups. So if, if it's not going to, if the computer decides to quit working, <clears throat> you know, when I was teaching, I always said, you know, when does a printer run out of ink? It, it runs out when the project's due. <laughs> At the same time, the computer crashes and all that stuff, too. And so you've got to have backups. Maybe you have a backup laptop. Maybe you've got a backup iPad. Maybe you have the stuff printed out. But you've got to show up with, with backup in case it doesn't work, which is second worst to not knowing how to use it. So definitely. <clears throat> Emily, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's really true. You always have to have a backup. Um, in terms of knowing your tools, um, I think similarly, uh, making sure that the tools you're using um, are worth the time it takes to produce them. Um, so are they you know, working tools where you're actually developing the design and using them for the presentation, um, I think is important. In terms of recording meetings, um, sometimes we'll record meetings. Um, I think it's Camtasia is the one we use for, the, um, for PowerPoints and things. Sometimes clients are a little sensitive about that, so you have to be careful. Um, but we have used some of that before. Oftentimes, we're just taking notes. Yeah. America, what about you? I mainly just take notes. Um, and as Emily was saying before, I'll go in usually with a list of goals for what the meeting, you know, what I need to ask, what I need to know, uh, make sure we cover. And then as they're talking, I'm, you know, first listening, but also trying to take notes on things. And then one thing I'll do is right after the meeting, as soon as it's over, I'll keep taking notes, just make sure it's really fresh and I've gotten everything down. I would say too, oftentimes um, we bring someone just to bring a team member just to take notes. Uh, it's really hard to be the presenter and the note taker at the same Definitely. time. Yeah. yeah. So that's a good that's a good tip. Another question. This is from Daniel. Um, I put this in the chat window so that everybody can see. Uh, do you guys have a sign off at the end of the meetings um, in order to be clear what was agreed upon uh, with your clients and such, all parties involved? Yeah, um. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it just depends on the milestone that you're at. Yeah. Um, sometimes this is sort of another very analog approach, but we'll just take a big, you know, there are those big oversized um, sticky notes that you can put on the wall, and we'll write down, you know, this is what was decided, you know, as it comes up. Um, so everyone sees their thoughts documented on the wall, and you can also um, track decisions, and it's very visible to everyone. I it haven't done that on it. It gives everyone that last chance to say, make sure that they actually agree, right? right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. Oh, that's, that's OK. I haven't done it on a per meeting basis, but um, there's probably a lot more people in your meetings. Um, I do it more on a per phase. Definitely before you move yeah. from one phase to another is you know, sign off on, yeah, 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 mm -hmm. this is what we agreed going forward. Yeah, because usually that means that's when you're going to get paid. Right, so it, it makes sense. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. OK, so Kevin, do we have more questions from the audience? Um, no, I think we have a little bit of a pause. Uh, but yeah, go on ahead. I think okay. we have a lot more to discuss. I had some more questions. So um, we talked about prospective clients. And, and sometimes you have to keep presenting. I mean, not sometimes, all the time. You have to keep presenting um, your ideas as they evolve to current clients, clients that, already, that have already hired you. Um, is there anything that you do difference with them or that you haven't talked about yet that has to do with presentations with current clients? Uh, let's see. You know, one thing we haven't really talked about that I was thinking about, um, and I would say it's it's both with prospective and current clients, is um, sort of setting the tone for a presentation. So sort of knowing what room you're presenting in, how big it is. Um, you know, PowerPoints can often feel very informal and disconnected. Um, 
do you want to all be sitting around a table, um, like Evan was saying, with a piece of trace paper? Is a PowerPoint presentation more appropriate? Um, do you want to be sitting or standing? Um, how do you engage uh, a client in discussion? Uh, is it meant to be interactive or not? Um, and setting those expectations at the beginning of the meeting, but sort of coming prepared with what type of meeting you want to hold. And sometimes that can change um, by client or even where you are in the process. Um, but being a little bit strategic about that right up front is important. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> Erica, anything you want to add? No. Uh, on you know much smaller scale, it's much easier. It's pretty much one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one. And um, so that's, I def that's where I usually get into the sketching. And it's definitely, you know, you're sitting around a table and right there and looking at drawings or looking at a model maybe. And, you know, then, then you're sketching ideas and just, uh, I'd say the back and forth is, I would say it's easier. But um, at the same time, I guess sometimes then you're really getting into discussions. But do you, do you go to their um, location or do you have them come to your studio? No, I I've usually um, or and and actually even if it's a new house, I would still go to their home. It's kind of where I feel like you learn a lot about them, and they can bring you into their space and show you. Um, especially in residential, that's what I'm designing is their home. Um, so I've not I've had um, consultants come into my office, uh, but otherwise, not sure that's a good idea. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, any other um, tools we haven't mentioned that you use during presentations? One thing that I was just thinking about is, you know, sometimes we have clients that are in other countries, um, and you're forced to use different types of presentation tools for a meeting. You know, video conferencing, for example, or an online meeting with Skype or GoToMeeting or something like that. Um, and so I think there it's, you know, getting the connection to work really well. Um, but um, it's, it, it, I don't know, it poses a challenge because you're not there to present the material right in front of them. So establishing that connection online is really hard, I think. Evan, any other tools we, we, uh, we need to hear from you? You know, like it is, it, it's best to do it in person, but I think if, you know, go to meeting works. We get a lot done over it. Yeah, it's a great tool, um, and and multiple people can be completely disconnected from each other, and you can save a lot of time and money instead of driving two hours to go somewhere and two hours back to just do it over the web. It it works. It's not the best, but it's good. Mm -hmm. Great. So Kevin, I think we have another question from the audience. Yeah, I have another one from Gil. Uh, Gil wants to know, would you consider using a questionnaire page based on your previous experience, previous knowledge with clients in general, or would you prefer to make the conversation more natural? Um, we've, we've used questionnaires on a lot of our projects. Um, so for school projects, for example, um, we've had questionnaires that go out to the board ahead of time, so we get a, an idea about you know what the big um, goals and vision are for the project. Um, we've also um, sent out questionnaires to the students. Um, on a, a local school project here, we actually had a middle school student um, send out a, I think it was through SurveyMonkey, but it was an online um, uh, survey um, to get, you know, what the students really thought about things, how the campus really works. Um, so using different tools to survey and get information um, I think is really interesting. We do um, sometimes you know, actual mapping exercises or drawing exercises with clients, um, board members, students, but just thinking about different ways of engaging um, the whole client to get uh, the information that you're looking for. Great. Um, I have something to say, but Evan, you if you have something, you'd probably be along the same lines there. Go ahead. Uh, okay, well, as far as the questionnaire, this is something I also have to give Mark LePage props on. Um, but once I am, actually not before the first meeting, but after the first meeting, um, I'll actually usually send a list of questions, and it's about you know how you use your home, how you live in your home. You know, do you watch TV? Where do you watch TV? A, a whole list of questions, and I actually have decided I'm going to change. I, I change those questions per um, client because some of them are, especially in New York City, some of them are <clears throat> completely irrelevant about a yard. 
<coughs> excuse me. Um, but what I found with that is it really shows that you are not just, you know, oh, you need two bedrooms and they're going to be here, um, but you're really starting to engage. And it, even if they don't want to answer the questions and send them back, they can write it down or think about it. <clears throat> it gets them kind of excited about their home. And then I'd like to sit down with them and we can go over. Um, and I've had, usually they just answer a few questions, but it'll at least be like questions to go from on, oh, and have you thought about this? And this is why I've asked this question. And now we can start a discussion on each part of their home. So in that way, uh, yeah, that was a great question. OK, that's great. So um, let's switch gears for a second here. We have the last 10 minutes. And I would really like to talk about um, how you document your work. Um, so uh, you know, you always have to show previous work, whether on your website or presentations or anything else. So do you work with a professional photographer, or do you take your own photos? Um, I think it depends on the size of the project. OK. Sometimes we use in-house photography, and sometimes we go out and hire somebody. We have a few that we work with, and they, they travel around and take photos. Mm -hmm. Even as the small firm here, I would say definitely hire a photographer. Um, and it's mainly because I know that my skill level isn't won't work. <laughs> um, but definitely hire a photographer. They know what they're doing, and you know it's that's how you present yourself to the world. So it's important. Um, Emily, do you have staff photographers at EHDD, or do you hire freelancers? Uh, we generally hire professional photographers. We have some sort of stellar in-house photographers as well, but I think um, most of our projects are documented by a professional. So um, how do you choose the right photographer? Like, How do you collaborate with the right photographer? How do you choose them? I'll, I'll jump in. I think um, you know because I usually am on the design side of the project, I kind of already know all the great angles that I want photographed. Um, and so for me, it's really important to be there when we, f if you know, and I and I have relationships with some photographers that go back 20 years, so I'm really comfortable working with them. And then if if that person isn't available, you know, we've got a few that we'll will fall back to or or use that you know maybe they're a little further away, but they're they're still great photographers. So we might have to pay a little bit more to get them. But I feel like. Um, having that relationship. It's just like architecture. You want to work with somebody you're comfortable with working with. So uh, if I'm there all day with them shooting, you know, I get a real keen sense of what they're like to work with. And, mm -hmm. and from what I found, I mean, most photographers are just so much fun to work with because they, they're seeing your project for the first or second time, and they're thinking about it in a, in a totally different way. And, and they're able to find things that you never even knew existed in your project. Um, and bring those to light. So I, for me, it's a really fun process, and I feel like once you find a couple that you want to work with, um, they're they're great to have on call. You know. Yeah, definitely. What about everybody else? Anything else to add about working with a professional photographer? Yeah. Well, to select, I mean, it's kind of like selecting an architect. You want to see their work, and you want to um, see if you like their work first of all. And um, I. Funny story is I actually when I called the photographer I was thinking you know oh geez I don't know what I can pay I don't know what I can do and actually just got into a conversation with him and you know in the same first conversation he was talking about which chairs which furniture he could loan me for the for the photo shoot and so just yeah they are just a lot of fun to work with and um, and at the same time I hadn't worked with him before brand new um, but you kind of figure they do know what they're doing so. Um, you know, kind of gave him free reign, and that's why you hire him. Yeah. But I do wish that I had also said, you know, a few more detail shots of this is really what I focused on to get a to get more. But I'll do that next time. <laughs> yeah, I think I would say too. It's really important. Um, I think that the process is best when it's collaborative with the photographer, and it's important to also know when you're on site. You know, what is the story that you're trying to get across? Um, what are the key design ideas that you focused on, and um, how do you evoke that through these photos? Yep. Exactly. It's tricky because yes. you always miss one or two, but <laughs> right, right. Good to think about that before. So we have six minutes left here, and I know we had some last-minute questions uh, coming in. So Kevin, do you want to ask the questions from our viewers? 
yes. Um, I do have one question from Bill. Uh, Bill is wondering if uh, there's any advice, if you guys have advice for uh, casual meetings in coffee shops. Hmm. Buy them coffee. <laughs> okay. Well, the coffee shops here are always so busy and so crowded and so loud. It's not necessarily ideal, um, but I guess it's a um, sort of neutral place, which was good. But I, I have a maybe I want to rephrase that question. I don't know. Um, did you say his name is Bill, um, Kevin? Yep. So Bill, uh, if you're watching this, let me let me know if um, if this is what you're thinking. Um, I, you know, I'm guessing that maybe Bill like doesn't have a big practice yet, so he's trying to figure out a way to meet people, and maybe his home or his studio is not ready for that. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have some tips on what people can do when they're uh -huh. beginning? They don't have a place and how they can handle that uh, when the commute is prohibitive to um, you know, their client's place or for whatever reason they don't want to go to their client's uh, location. I don't necessarily have personal experience with that, but I, would, you know, I work at coffee shops quite often because it's not my office and I can get a lot more done even if it is busy and noisy. Um, so I feel like it's a fine place to have a meeting that and and it really they're so available there's there's um you know there's drinks to be had and there's restrooms and there's everything there's wireless there's everything you need so you know if you have a laptop or an iPad and some and a little tabletop and some trace paper i think it's it's fine i don't i don't necessarily have any other experience beyond that though yeah um I wish I remembered the name of the app or the website, but I know I've seen two where, um, I know this happens in San Francisco, I don't know about other cities, where you can reserve someone else's conference room or meeting space. Yeah. Um, you know, there are a lot of office spaces downtown that go unused. Um, I'll have to look up. I have it written down somewhere. I'll have to look it up and post it. But Oh, please do. Yes, please mm -hmm. post it. That would be a great resource, I think, for everybody. I wish I remembered yeah. it. Okay, any more questions, Kevin? Yes, I have two more. Um, this is from Mike. Uh, if you guys are faced with a heavy workload, do you guys ever sub out creation of 3D models such as uh, SketchUp to assist with presentations? So we've outsourced um, models and presentation drawings before. Um, my personal experience is that sometimes it actually takes more work than just doing it yourself. Um, and when you're doing a presentation drawing yourself, you're kind of getting into it and learning it, tweaking kind of what you want to show. Um, oftentimes when you send it out, it takes two or three rounds of um, sort of working back and forth to really get it to look like you want to look. Um, it is a great um, sort of inexpensive way to get renderings and other things done really quickly. Um, I think our success has been sort of mixed. Yeah, we've subbed out renderings before. Um, we build all of our own models. I don't, I don't know that I would trust anyone to actually create the space that we're envisioning in our house. But um, renderings is another story. And one, of, we've outsourced only a couple times for competition work because the deadline is so tight. And the great thing is, is that you know, for me, China's on the other side of the planet, so they're working while I'm sleeping. Right. And when I wake up, I can mark it up and I can send it back and, and continue to work on it. And then it, that cycle is it's like nonstop at that point. And so that works really well. Um, but I also will say that they are those, um, those kind of people, the freelance guys running on those um, outsourcing websites, like they stick to their guns when it comes, you know, and, and we, we tend to nitpick and say, fix this, fix this, fix this. <laughs> and they get to a point and they say, we're done. Yeah. And then they just don't return your emails, they don't return your calls, and, and, that, and what you have is what you have. So you've got to watch out for that, too. Because, and, and it makes sense, right? I mean, I don't blame them. Yeah. Um, I'm always going to ask for more. But um, they, they definitely know when to say when, unlike me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Merica, did you ever have to do that? Did you ever have to? Or did you, yeah, yeah I, I, would, um, I have outsourced renderings. Um, just it's it takes me too much time. It's probably not worth it, at least not for me. Um, but as far as presentation drawings and everything else, of course I do that. Um, and the SketchUp models, I actually learn a lot from building it in SketchUp. So I kind of work back and forth with SketchUp and 2D anyway. So I I uh, they they definitely take my models and clean them up. But 
uh, that's mainly for the rendering. Yeah. You know, we've also done, um, we've worked with companies that build existing buildings in Revit or other programs. So sometimes that's useful if you're working with an existing mm. building. Again, you can send it out. They'll build it for you really quickly. <laughs> that's what they're good at. Um, we've even had digital scans of existing buildings done that are then brought in as sort of a point cloud into Revit. Um, so things like that are really useful. So Kevin, back to you. Um, Oh, yeah, so I just have two more questions. Uh, this one's for Marika, uh, and another one's for Evan. Um, Gil wants to know, uh, have you had to make sketches in front of your clients in the first meeting, if necessary? Um, I would say usually not, but mainly that's because the first meeting is really just the get to know you. <coughs> um, do you want to hire me as your architect? Um, we've never gotten into sketches at that point. Um, and I don't think I'm perfect at sketching, so I'm not just gonna, you know, draw them their fabulous uh, home. But um, definitely in the in the next meeting, which would be the you know a real, not, maybe I'm not necessarily hired hired, but yeah, we're in it, we're into the design. So um, I would say yes, that I would sketch. One is for Evan. Uh, how many people work in Evan's firm? Uh, you know, I th we have about ten offices. And there's probably 350 to 400 people. Something like that. Great. Wow. So if we don't have any more questions, let me see right here. OK. If we don't have any more <coughs> questions, I actually, before we switch to the slides, I think, um, Evan, you posted something on our event page, and people were um, trying to figure it out. Uh, Kevin, can you find that thing you sent me? Uh, something about kleptomaniacs. Uh, <laughs> Do you want to explain it for oh, everybody? Oh, just a joke. Yeah, it's just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he's not going to explain it to you guys, so you have to figure it you out have to by figure yourself. It out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to thank you, everybody. Um, before we switch back to the slides, thank you so much for participating, and we will be posting the recording, of course, um, online, and we'll tag you. And remember to post all your links. Uh, America, we were going to show um, this great um, construction video she made on one of her projects. I'll post that link as well. So any Thank last you. minute advice, thought, you know, anything you want to say before um, I close this? Have fun. I think presentations need to be way more fun. <laughs> I love that. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> great. Okay, well, thank you everybody for participating in our latest um, Google Hangout, How to Succeed in Architecture about the Art of Presentation. So um, this will br was brought to you um, by Novetch. And uh, if you want to contact us, we are all over the internet. You can find us on Facebook, Google+, and um, on Twitter. And that's actually um, the wrong Twitter account for some reason. Huh. I don't know how that happens. So it's at Novedg, uh, not at Novedg. So it's just at Novedg um, right there. OK. Uh, thank you from the team and Novedg. And I'm going to end the broadcast right now. <laughs>